This is Emily Hall for the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program at Oklahoma State. Today is Tuesday, March 6, 2018, and I'm interviewing Chris Murphy for the Deep Roots Oklahoma Authors Oral History Project. Chris, you're a fiction writer, creative writing professor at NSU, and from what I hear, Tahlequah's number one Red Sox fan. Which we'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah. Thanks for taking the time to talk with me. Yeah, absolutely. So you're not from Oklahoma, right? Mm -hmm. So where were you born and where did you grow up? As I like to say that I was born in, in Boston. Um, I'm actually from a town called Belmont, which is like 20 minutes outside of Boston. And it's one of those things where if folks are not from Boston, I say Boston. Mm -hmm. And then if they actually know Boston, they say, oh, what part of Boston? I say, I'm from Belmont and feel ashamed. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Because Belmont is like a white bread suburb and not nearly as interesting or as um, well known as Boston. So how would you describe Boston? Um, surly and um, oddly conservative in, 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 in oddly parochial mm -hmm. in, in self-satisfied and those are all the kind of negative things I'd say about Boston. You know, there's, it's, it thinks very highly of itself um, mm -hmm. and thinks very highly of its history and of its sports teams and of its kind of place in education. But it's also just, I don't know, I think it's the greatest American city. Like, I really, I love it. I love it to death just because it's this wonderful mix of, it's big enough to have things, it's big enough to have culture, it's big enough to have food it's big enough to that you can walk but it's small enough that you can actually walk and the people are surly on the surface and surprisingly warm and the, the the humor there is just great like it's a wonderful mix of kind of dry and raunchy and like a little bit edgy i don't know and it's it's i've been here for seven years and i've been in this part of the country for over a decade now so I've lived here longer than I've lived anywhere but Boston, um, but it's still home. You know, I go there and it's, there's some sort of resonance that just doesn't go away. And it's not just memory, it's something about the place that just really still hits me. Yeah. So how would you describe Tahlequah, Oklahoma, Oklahoma to a Bostonian? Is that what you call? Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. Got, is that right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Describe Tahlequah to a Bostonian? Uh-huh. Boston to a Tahlequahian. Um, <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> is like it's a little bit funky and a little bit hippie and it's not what usually when I describe it I say it's not what they expect when they think of Oklahoma like you know when you think of Oklahoma you think of cowboys and you think of red dirt and you think of like long flat expanses and tornadoes and, um, and Tahlequah is really none of those things so if, if they have any sort of points of reference that I'll say it's like, I, I draw first to like close regional references that I think it's kind of like Eureka Springs, Arkansas, um, in that kind of like hippie, like slightly more liberal than its surroundings, slightly more like new agey and like uh, a little less normative than I think a lot of Oklahoma in terms of like rural conservative uh, values. Um, but if I have to describe to a Bostonian, I'll say it's surprisingly green and it's, mm -hmm. it's small, um, and surprisingly liberal, at least for Oklahoma and, and kind of a really warm community. Like in, I, I never knew small town living until I lived in Tahlequah and I see, of course, some of the drawbacks, but a lot of the benefits of small town living here. So I tend to extol those virtues. And then oftentimes I try to disabuse stereotypes, like, you know, thinking that, it's all cowboys or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. So what do your friends and family back home think of your move to here? Do they visit? Yeah. Um, I mean, first, so I first lived in Fayetteville because that's where I went to grad school. Mm -hmm. And most of my friends and family back home just have, as I did when I moved, just like a whole bunch of like prejudices and stereotypes um, that were kind of shitty. Mm -hmm. And... You know, all the like, oh, do people wear shoes and outdoor plumbing and all that sort of stuff. Um, and, and I would kind of come back and be like, no, it's not that way. It's not that way. And then I would, I would slip and say y'all and they would look aghast at me and just <laughs> be horrified at what I was becoming. Um, and then they came and visited 
a lot of them, first my family, my family just fell in love with Fayetteville. They, they, mm -hmm. they think the world of it. I mean, my, my folks now come back partially to visit me and partially to visit Fayetteville. Um, and then my friends kind of came and visited, some of my college friends, my high school friends. And I remember one time one of them was kind of hanging out with me. We were at the bar and he was like, Murphy, for the longest time, this I was just mystified and kind of like unsettled by you living here. And I get it now. Like, I get it. I get why you're here. I get, I get the allure. And a lot of that kind of transferred to, to Tahlequah. When, when friends visit me and family visit me, they get it. You know, they kind of look around and they go, for one thing, they think the campus is gorgeous. And they don't expect the campus to be as nice. And they know how much I love my job. Mm -hmm. So once I take them to the campus and I show them my office, and then we'll walk around town and you get that kind of like small town where people will be like, Murphy, and I'll be like, what's up, man? And, hey, hey, Mr. Murphy, I'm like, how are you doing? Like, have summer classes, whatever. Um, and they can kind of see that like small town, like, comfort expressed and they get it pretty quickly you know and then they'll do what i still do which is kind of dwell a little bit on the absences like oh you don't have this and like no <laughs> like, like oh you know can we get some you know like we talked about this yeah, get some brunch and be like yeah brunch probably is not going to really happen and be like oh, how about some indian food like no not really and they're like how oh, come you know like, what sort of cultural things it's like well we'll go to tulsa um, <laughs> well, it's kind of a cultural shock or you don't yeah or it's easy to forget um what a diff what another place has mm -hmm. until you're here and kind of thinking of it yeah and missing it yeah and that's so much of like I don't know I feel like so much of my life is just defined this sounds awful but defined by like discomfort and absence because yeah. I keep on going to places and be like I'm not fully comfortable here <laughs> and like oh this doesn't have this and like I'll go home and be like you know people really are more rude here <laughs> they're, <laughs> they're much less nice like like I held the door just say thank you like what's the you know what's what's holding your back and then I come. You know, I come back here and I'm like, man, I can, I can really go for some like good sushi, and that just is not happening. <laughs> <laughs> so, how do you adjust to small town living, like meeting people and making friends, or feeling like you're part of the community? At first, really poorly. Yeah. Um, so it's hard. Yeah, and it's. I had this thing again. I came like a lot of times. I feel like I move, and I'm a real slow chewer. I'm slow to adjust, and I'm, and I, I kind of hold on to habits or aspects that I shouldn't. And so when I first moved here, I was coming from grad school or a little bit after grad school. And I, I, I keep in touch with my high school friends and my college friends and my grad school friends. I'm very close to my family. So I had this kind of like bad attitude where I came here and I was just like, I don't really need any more people in my life. You know, like I don't, I don't I'm not looking for friends. I'm not looking for, you know, closeness. And, and I saw this, like I was lucky to have this job. And I saw it as like a, a, a chance to live like a monastic life, which I really did for the first few years. Hmm. And I, at the time I had a girlfriend, she lived in um, Springfield, Missouri. So I would travel there. She would travel here for the first year or so. Um, and then that fell apart and I got even more monastic. And it was just, my life was teaching and my life was writing. And then when I needed to socialize, I would go elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and then have to like reintegrate because I hadn't talked to anybody in the summertime, especially I hadn't talked to anybody for like a week and I just did not know how to be a person. <laughs> and they'd be like, oh, this is how conversation works. Mm -hmm. um, and then as I lived here and I just kind of got integrated into the community, um, it, it happened naturally because it's one of the great things about small towns, like you can affect change and you can, you can get involved in things in, in ways that are, there are far lower barriers to entry. So, you know, it's just like taking part of the, the writing group here and, and then taking part, like I'm part of the arts council and mm -hmm. then taking part in university life and making sure there's no town and gown thing so that like, you know, I'm part of the university, but but I try to be in and amongst the community and and, and, and do fundraisers and, um, and just interact with folks around. And I started going out with a gal who's from around here, so I started to, to know more folks from around the community. And there's this kind of natural like broadening process where I felt more at home and felt like I could really affect some positive change in very minor, partial ways. And the folks around here, I think, adopted me partially because I shed as much of my snobbery as I could. And there is so much snobbery when people come to Oklahoma, they just get yeah. really like snooty about stuff. And some of it's justified and some of it is just like easy targets, like low hanging fruit. And so I tried to shed those things and I, I feel like a lot of folks around here appreciated that I wasn't coming with a boatload of, of expectations that weren't being met and keeping my nose up in the air. Mm -hmm. um, 
and then also I think in some ways I was like the token Northeasterner and they're like, oh, say this phrase. And I'd like mm -hmm. ham up the accent and say the phrase. They're like, ah, you know, like, I've like, hey, been to Boston. Like, this thing was lovely. And I'm like, yeah, that thing is lovely. I love this restaurant. I love that place. And so like, it's, I'm some sort of, I've often said this is way making it sound way more important than it is, but I, I often, often feel like I serve like an ambassadorial role. Mm -hmm. So like here, I feel like I'm an ambassador for the Northeast. And I'm like, we're not all snobs. And like, <laughs> you know, like, like we're, we're normal folks and we're like we're not all caricatures and then I go back home and I'm like I'm like yeah I hear all of you guys like stereotyping like the middle of the country like when's the last time you've been to the middle of the country like mm -hmm. you're not right about this let me tell you how you're not right so what are what are people's favorite uh, phrases to hear you say oh they do the whole park, park the car and Harvey park the car and Harvey yard you know <laughs> I have like my 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 rundown of things that I think sound best in the Boston accent. There's no Margot Shapara, who was a former Red Sox shortstop. There is Wicked Pissa, which is the common phrase for something being great that actually no Bostonians say, but that we say for other people. <laughs> um, there's Doppler radar. <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, you yeah. need to give a weather report. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> told me that on the Doppler radar. And then there's my new favorite, which is Otterbox. <laughs> like, like your, the Otterbox, the protective case for a phone. Oh, yeah. So, and I, I feel like it can just be widely applied. So, yeah, put it in your Otterbox. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That's good. Yeah. Do you have any Oklahoma oriented hobbies? Um, no. Okay. Like no I <laughs> no God no I, you couldn't I'm so terrified <laughs> no I've been waiting for someone to invite me out hunting for forever specifically squirrel hunting because I feel like that's an animal I could kill and not feel too bad about it mm -hmm. and I ate squirrel once and kind of liked it and so I'd kind of like to eat it again um, and I keep on dropping hints with my friends around here who hunt I'm like oh hunting you know I've always wanted to try that oh hunting like oh when are you going out you know and. I don't know if they just don't trust me with a firearm or something, but... <laughs> I, I do you have that. camo? I do, but only because this last Halloween, my girlfriend and I dressed up as... She was Bob Ross and I was a happy tree. And so <laughs> I, bought, I bought camo to dress up as the happy tree. Yeah. Okay. So I think it's probably a non-traditional reason to... <laughs> but you to have to, get. so maybe wear that. Yeah. And, and they'll take you out. Yeah, maybe I'll just wear it around and drop pants. I'm wearing this camo. So you've written about uh, being named Tahlequah's number one Sox fan. Yeah. How'd that happen? I mean, I mean, so so here's the like the monastic thing, right? It's like I, I live the monastic life. I also like probably drink more than I should, and I love baseball. So around ba especially around playoff season, I would just I didn't have cable at my house. This is the whole like you know like living like trying to live as simplistically as possible and, and with as few distractions. But I love baseball, so I would go to the bars especially during the playoffs and, and just in just nervous drink and nervous smoke cigarettes because I was stressed out about the Sox winning and losing and they get super celebratory. And especially I was here for 2013 when the Sox won mm -hmm. the world series. Um, and for playoff appearances a few years before that I was out and about the bars and everyone knew me as caring a great deal. Um, and so I think I just, I earned it by, hard labor <laughs> just, <laughs> yeah. just being at the bars and just drinking a whole bunch and probably getting more demonstrative than I should did you bring other people in to enjoy watching the the Red Sox with you did you convert anyone to being a fan yeah I don't think permanently but like yeah. temporarily I definitely did just because I think I was so about it that like it, it was just kind of infectious it was more like this is entertaining to watch how fired up he like I think find baseball boring but I can watch Murphy like get all fired up about it so therefore I'm gonna root for the Red Sox to do well just so I can watch him be an idiot <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what's your earliest baseball memory I went to this is actually kind of a messed up story but I went to a Red Sox game with my father um my two earliest memories, actually, and I can't, I can't remember which one came first. One, I went to a Red Sox game with my father and was sitting on the first base line, and whoever was at bat hit a foul ball, and it, like, screamed at me. And I am a flinchy person and was a very flinchy child and terrified of balls. And so it was a good instinct, but I ducked, and the ball hit the woman behind me who was holding a baby. 
And so it hit her in the face and she was bleeding all over her baby. It was awful. And I turned around and it was like, it like saw this woman bleeding in like agony and like while holding her child. And I was like, I'm responsible for that. And so like one of my first memories of baseball was like this terrible, like, like mess of like fear and guilt. Um, and then the other thing I remember is the, the Red Sox losing the 1986 World Series. I was seven at the time. Um, and Bill Buckner, the ball went through Buckner's legs and, and, um, and then losing in this spectacular fashion, which became part of Red Sox lore and, and Boston lore. And I remember just thinking that a lot of people were going to be really upset about it. Like there was like my perception was, was limited, but, but active enough to realize like this was going to make a lot of people sad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So my, my first memory is not at all pleasant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> at all. Yeah. So, um, what about memorable experiences at Fenway Park? Do you have some top memories or stories? Yeah, there. I mean, there's some like classic. You know, like I saw David Ortiz hit a walk off home run. Um, I remember after the Red Sox finally beat the Yankees in 2004, in kind of rushing the the streets. I was in a friend's apartment. Mm-hmm. Um, right around Fenway and so rushing the streets with my friends and kind of going out there until the riot police came out and mm-hmm. broke everything up and started mm-hmm. shooting flashbangs or whatever. Um, yeah, and so those are the kind of like the, the standard ones, but in, in like I sang, I was in like a, a, an acapella group in high school and we sang the national anthem there. Um, and so there's game related stuff. I was there when Pedro came back. Like I never went to a playoff game there, which is still a, a real kind of gap in my life experience. But a lot of what I love about Fenway is what, a lot of what I love about baseball is, is just the kind of the the return, like the the regularity and the return, the kind of cyclical nature. So every time I go home, last summer was actually the first time in since I moved to Arkansas that I did not return to Fenway. Mm-hmm. Um, it just didn't work out when I was home that they the Sox were traveling. It just really did not work out. And there was it's similar to when I go home and I need to smell the sea, like I need to go to the sea. And I'm terrified of the sea. I'm terrified of sharks. Um, but there's something about every summer I need that kind of like return. It's that way with Fenway. Like I need to mm-hmm. see the grass. I need to hear the accents around me. I need to eat a Fenway Frank. I need to, to feel the kind of warmth of the bodies and the two small seats and everybody feeling this kind of, this, this similarity of purpose and wanting the Red Sox to win and this kind of shucking of, um, other concerns, you know, like Fenway is, is even for Boston, which is a white city, it is too white and it is, it is increasingly too gentrified within the park. So it's not necessarily like a place where barriers are broken down or whatever, but you go in there and there's a shedding of um, external concern, political concern, life concern. And you can really kind of indulge in this beautiful, methodical, rhythmic thing that is baseball. And that's, I mean, coming back in bad times of my life, disjointed times in my life and I kind of come back and it's a real centering thing yeah so the Red Sox cursed no 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 they never were and they yeah. and they certainly aren't now like I mean they were cursed by certain things they had a, an owner who was fantastically racist and he hamstrung the team because his racist policies he put his racist policies as so many owners did but he was pretty bad Yaki was pretty bad um above his racist ideologies, above the performance of the team. I mean, they had a chance to sign Jackie Robinson, and they did not. Um, they had a chance to sign, I believe, Willie Mays, and they did not. Mm-hmm. Um, so if, if there was a curse, some of it was happenstance, and a lot of it was just poor management. I don't yeah. believe in curses. <laughs> and now they've won three know. times in the past, like, yeah. 14 years. So that whatever was there is no longer there. Yeah. yeah. So what do you think it is about sports that, um, that ignites angst or elation i'm kind of thinking of how passionate people around here get about college football Mm -hmm. what do you think it is about about sports that does that for people i think one of the aspects and it's it's a super complex thing it's a real cultural thing a tribal thing and it's a it's a i think one of the main things certainly in my life but i see it a lot around here is it's it's a a realm of discourse for folks who are not always comfortable with discourse. Like mm-hmm. when I've had trouble talking to men, you know, like yeah. dudes, like real dudes. And like, you know, I'm not a real dude, but I can talk dude. And like, there's some of that is the language of sports that like you can access this kind of discourse. Whereas you don't 
the conversation is really stilted or difficult otherwise. It's, it's a hard to find the kind of ground upon which to stand. And I, especially around here where folks can be even more terse than they are back home, although in Boston people are more voluble, but they certainly are not, I think, any more likely to divulge innermost feelings or secrets. We're not Californians. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but the, um, I think sports provides like a venue for that. And so I see it around here, and it's one of the things around here that like, I know I can fall back on. Like if I've got, you know, be it students or be it like dudes that I just see out and like, you know, like we obviously don't have many commonalities. We, there's this kind of weirdness around men interacting anyways. And it's not just men, of course, but yeah. I find it particularly around men um, that you can kind of broach sports and it allows like this, this shared language and shared experience, even if you're not fans of the same teams that, that, I mean, you can pass the time, you can shoot the shit, you can you can make something less awkward, or you can even develop some sort of connection. Uh, and I think that is one of the, you know, is should it be that way? Maybe not. You know, maybe we should be more open and expressive and we should whatever. But, like, I think it, it is that way, and I think it's not a bad thing at all. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm going to change topics a little bit and yeah. talk about your path to becoming um, a writer. So... Mm -hmm. Were there moments in your childhood where you just kind of thought to yourself, this is something that I'd like to do? Yeah. I mean, yeah. there was always a creative impulse, right? Mm -hmm. There was, I always was making stuff. Yeah. Um, and I was always kind of an introvert and always just super imaginative. And like, that sounds like a, like, oh, what an imaginative kid. Like, that's mm -hmm. like a real positive. And it wasn't always. I mean... You know, an overactive imagination meant that, like, a lot of times, especially, like, you know, you get it around Boston as you get it around here, you know, people would be like, you're weird. You know, like, you're a weird kid. Like, you're weird. You know, like, I don't know how to handle you. You're you're, you're making me feel uncomfortable. And that happened a lot. <laughs> you know? Because like, I would just say strange stuff, you know? Like, yeah. or, like I, would, I would go off on these tangents or, like, I would be by myself and, like, talking to myself. And, like, other parents would be like, is he okay? You're... You know, Chris seems like a weird kid. And my parents are like, no, it's not. No, <laughs> that's just that's how Chris is. Um, but I always had, like, a, I guess, a, a kind of rich inner life. You know, I could mm -hmm. play by myself really well, you know, and, and, and develop stories. And, yeah. you know, these stories first were, like, G.I. Joe, like, He-Man, you know, or, like, they were they were kind of, like, these narratives that were channeled into toys and things like that. And then I read comic books and started doing them myself. Um, and then there was, there was no doubt also something that I kind of try to deprogram in my own students, like this, the, the cultural um, currency of being a writer, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. oh, you're a writer, oh, that's, you know, that has like certain attributes that are attached to it that I think are kind of silly. Um, but I, I picked up on them pretty early in my early adolescence and I was like, oh, if I am a writer, it allows me to get away with X, it, like it makes me more attractive to Y, it, you know, like it, they're the kind of trappings of being a writer. In terms of actually writing, um, it, I think it, it came about like most, a lot of writers where there was essentially this, this impulse and there's this desire and it, it needed to get out, you know, like, and it, it leads to a lot of like bad cathartic, like bedroom poetry, mm -hmm. which I wrote an ungodly amount of and, and glad is gone because it was yeah. so bad. Um, but I think that was, you know, it was that kind of like in some ways, I think it's an impulse. It's just how that impulse gets channeled. Like, you don't have much choice in the matter. And I don't think I had much choice in the matter. And I was always pretty good at it. I was always a reader. I was encouraged to read from a real young age. I've always read a lot. Um, and so it kind of found its natural avenue. And then there were certain folks who encouraged it along the way. My mother encouraged it. I had, I got hit by a car in high school and like mm -hmm. it knocked the legs out. It was totally my own fault. I ran in front of a bus on a highway access road and didn't see this old mobile coming 35 and it like swept the legs out from under me and like smashed the windshield and got thrown onto a snowbank. It was totally fine. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, it was totally fine. Like not scratch on me. Wow. Um, yeah, and like, in like the, there was a kid in the car and he was terrified and the, the guy thought he had killed me and he was terrified. Um, and I had a, a high school teacher and he was like, Murphy, write that. You know, he's mm -hmm. like that. Because I talked to him about it. He's like, man, this is something. Write that. And he was just a good teacher. He was just encouraging me to kind of like express myself and get out. And I wrote it. And I, I gave it to him. And he said, you know, I think you got something here. Like, this, is, this is good. I think you got something here. And that sort of positive reinforcement led me down the path. You know, there's there a very 
narrow strip of territory between what I enjoy doing and what I'm at all confident at, and writing exists in that narrow mm-hmm. territory. Is there a particular book that stands out for you that maybe had an influence on you earlier, like early in your life, formative or transformational experience reading it? Yeah, the Lloyd Alexander's The Book of Three series, which is like a kind of Tolkien knockoff that uses Welsh mythology to tell mm-hmm. your epic standard kind of chosen one narrative about a rags to riches, you know, boy who was like a tended pigs and he went on to be king, that sort of thing. Um, that, I, I remember latching onto him when I was young, in second grade or something like that, and reading it, and it just, it was, it, it was transformative, and then you, know, you get all those kind of joys of reading, like I forgot that I existed, and I was, and I identified with this guy, and I, I kind of was living in this world, and I suffered with him, and, and celebrated with him, and, and got really sad at the end, and I realized that, like, the journey was over, mm-hmm. and, um, you know, that sort of, like, genre of fantasy, standard, like, chosen one story just hooked me. And then there were, you know, there have been books at various stages throughout my life that have changed me in various ways. But I think Lloyd Alexander was one of the early ones who, like, who allowed me to access that world in the way that it was, it was so rich that I just want to keep coming back and back and back and trying different books and all that. Yeah. So did you study um, English as an undergraduate? Mm-hmm. Or, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and again, it was the sort of thing that, like, I was just not very good at other things. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and my parents had certain restrictions. They were like, you know, we'll pay for college. You cannot major in philosophy. And you cannot, like, I think major in music or something like that. And I briefly wanted to major in music because I fancied myself a guitar player. It was awful. <laughs> and I actually had a friend who was who in freshman year, and he read a story that I wrote. And he was like, oh, Murphy, thank God. I'm like, what? He was like, I thought you were going to be as bad at writing as you were a guitar. Oh, <laughs> and no. I was, yeah, I was like, what? There you go. Well, that. Um, does um, reality. Where did you go to college? Brown. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in, in Rhode Island. And, and that was like, yeah, so I studied English there. And I already knew that I was, you know, I wrote in high school and I wrote in, you know, I, I wrote a column for the newspaper. Like, everyone, I already styled myself as a writer. And mm-hmm. folks kind of, like, labeled me as such. And then, like, an English person, I was always just really good at that stuff. Yeah. Um, and so I went to school and it was a really natural progression. And then Brown was so wonderful Mm -hmm. a a place and the people there I met I mean those friends I I am still really close to and it's just that was a wonderfully supportive place and they also encouraged it you know they 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 kind of valued how much I had already read and how much I enjoyed writing and reading and they encouraged his peers Um, and so in hindsight there really wasn't much choice in the matter I I very rarely had choice in the matter Mm -hmm. Yeah. It seems like it was all set pretty early on. Chose, chose you. Yeah. What was it like um, going to school there? I, I'm just kind of thinking in contrast to living in Boston. Did you miss, were there things about Boston area that, that you missed? No. Or did you just not think about it? No, I thought about it a lot. Cause I, so I went to middle school and high school, I went to an all boys school. And it was a real kind of like old school English model, like suit and tie, Latin till ninth grade. Um, no facial hair, top butt button, you know, top button button type thing. And I love my friends from from there still, but I found it a really restricted environment. Like I mm-hmm. really bucked against it hard. And at first I bucked against it in kind of like your standard ways. Like I remember being like running for student government and like listening to Rage Against the Machine the night beforehand and then writing a speech about how we should like abolish the student government because it was just a puppet thing to make students feel better. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and then that didn't work. So I started turning to like less... Um, healthy modes of bucking against where I was. Um, and, and by the time I got to the end of high school, I was done. I was done with being home. I was done with that school. I was done. Like I felt like it was too prescribed and like the value systems I didn't share. And so I got to Brown and it was like, it was like a, a warmth that I really hadn't occurred before. I was like, these people are like me and these people kind of value the things that, you know, that everyone else was like, Oh, you like birds of prey. You're a weirdo. Like, why? Okay, that's weird. I guess whatever. And I got to Brown and I was like, yeah, I wanted to be a falconer for a long time. Like, I studied birds of prey. Like, I went to all sorts of bird sanctuaries. And they were like, bird sanctuary is cool. Like, what birds do you like? And I'm like, I think that's cool. No one thinks that's cool. Um, So I thought about home a lot, but I thought, you know, and I've come to really be glad for the the education I got and for the friends that I made. But Mm -hmm. man, Brown came at just the right time to keep me from probably 
going down some bad paths. Yeah. Just because I found a hole. Yeah. What did you do after college? Did you find a job or travel? Mm, yeah, I, I, so I, I did a study abroad um, my junior year. And while I was there, I, I fell in love with a gal um, where I was studying abroad in Ireland. And so <laughs> after I graduated college, I moved back to be with her essentially until my visa ran out and they told me I had to leave um, and worked in a bookstore. Which again, like this is all I can put it's, it's like I mean, all these jobs are like they all follow a very narrow course. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I worked at a university bookstore and lived with her and kind of enjoyed the Irish life and, and then got bounced out. And I and I went through like most undergrads, I think, the kind of post collegiate washout. Mm-hmm. So I like you know, I waited tables, I did office work. Um, I was lousy at all of it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just, I'm, I'm not a morning person. I'm not good in the, I was just lousy. I was not very good and I was surly and I was unhappy. The relationship dissolved. Um, and so I spent probably my most unhappy years were my return to Boston in between kind of graduating from college and, um, and going to Ireland and then ultimately moving away from Boston. It was a really miserable time. Um, and I felt really rootless and, and just, mm-hmm. just unstructured and like I, but I was just failing at everything um, and yeah did a, a hodgepodge of jobs that didn't go anywhere yeah nah. did you keep journals or some kind of record of how you felt during that time that you use later and in, in your work or no were you writing at all or oh did yeah you I was writing kind the whole time of, yeah. yeah I've never st- I mean I've never stopped oh, okay um, so yeah I was writing I'd, I'd moved into really writing like short fiction, mm-hmm. um, and so I was writing short stories. I didn't. I'm, I'm a lousy journaler. I, I'm not consistent enough. I'm not disciplined enough, and I don't like talking. It's not. You would know it from <laughs> <laughs> from me talking, but I don't really like talking about myself in my work. At least it's, it's an uncomfortable space for me to be in. Um, yeah. So yeah, I was just writing short stories nonstop, um, and taking like extension school classes and. Um, in, in kind of like, there's an organization called Grub Street, which is a writing organization in Boston. It was really lovely. And I took classes with them and I found some folks I could study with, a little Jane Rosenzweig in the extension school. And then I wrote Fool, and he was a wonderful man, and I can't remember his name now, but I took him with Grub Street. And, and I just tried to keep my hand in it. But also it was like, that was one of the only things that kind of provided me with self-worth in that time, it's like creating stories. So I just kept mm-hmm. on, kept on writing. So how long after um, undergrad did you wait before applying to MFA programs? And, and why did you choose Arkansas? I know they have a good reputation um, yeah, for I, your school, and it's a, it's a great school to get into. Yeah, a lot of that writing. was like real happenstance. Yeah. Um, so I waited, I it was about three years, three, four years between graduating undergrad and going to graduate school. Um, Spent about a year waiting tables and such, and then a couple of years working in an office until like various offices, because my father's office, so various office politics got him bounced and they got me bounced, and so I like lived in Philly for a while, like worked for I did pamphleting for a strip club and <laughs> worked, oh, and worked yeah. at, at the Liberty Bell gift shop. Yeah, it was a strange summer, um, <laughs> and then went to and then went to Arkansas. And how it happened is I, I essentially I I applied to MFA programs once and got rejected by all of them. You know, your Iowa's, your Michigan's, your Michigan's, your, um, you know, all the way down Florida and Greensboro and just got roundly rejected. And then I was, I was in a writing group at the time. Then one of my, the people I was in the writing group with was like, you should look at Arkansas. Especially this dude down there, Skip Hayes, has a great reputation as a good teacher. Um, it's supposed to be a good program. Um, and so I, I applied again and I got waitlisted to one place and I got accepted to Arkansas and rejected from everywhere. Else. Hmm. And so it was It was much less a matter of choice and more a matter of like, I'm, I didn't get in anywhere else. Yeah. Um, and then I went down there and again, I, I came with like, just this like, this knapsack of, of prejudices. And I was like, I'm going to go visit Arkansas, we'll see. And I went to Fayetteville. And first, this was early on before they kind of developed that area, but that airport's kind of out of the way, XNA is out of the way. Mm-hmm. And like, it used to be you kind of drive, do a little bit of country driving to get from XNA to yeah. the highway. And I was like, oh, man, this was a mistake. <laughs> and then I got to Fayetteville, and I was like, oh. and so first of all, it was similar to, like, it was similar to Brown in that, like, 
first I got to the, the place and I went to like Dixon Street Bookshop, which is one of yeah. my favorite places on the planet. You know, like this, this you know, the, the books from floor to ceiling, like, like towering in and that smell, that wonderful used book smell. It's just so, and I was like, oh my God, I love this place. And, and then I went to, you know, I walked down Dixon Street and I was like, wow, this town's really kind of nice. I like its vibe. And, you know, the campus is beautiful. And then I went and sat in workshops. Um, and took some classes, and then they were having a pub crawl that night, and so I ended up hanging out with all the folks and going on the pub crawl with them. And um, before missing my flight the next morning, um, and actually it was just like, man, I really could, I can see myself here. You know, I can see myself hanging out with these people. These are writers, and it'd been three years, and I had been hanging out with waiters and in in office folk, and I nobody except for those two classes I took. And, and occasionally my girlfriend kind of nurtured the writing. Again, I was just doing it by myself. And to, to talk with people who were writers and to talk craft and to trade authors and to, um, and to trade stories, it just felt so good that I was like, I want, that was it, I was sold. Yeah. yeah I was going to and you had, a, you had a chance to, to teach mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. this, was that the first time you had taught school? Oh, yeah. And what happened with that? Just like it was, you like it? Yeah, it was the sort of thing where like I, I was only doing it so I could write. You know, yeah. like it was like that that was the tuition waiver and I didn't want to take on any debt. So you, you taught, you know, mm -hmm. and like they, I think they're better at it now. But then they, you had like a two week boot, boot camp, <laughs> where like, here's your curriculum. Here's like how you might approach these things. OK, there's your class. Go to it, you know. And so like just throw you in front of a bunch of freshmen. And at that time, I was not much older than that. I was 25, 26. Um, and I discovered like total I did not see it coming. Total serendipity that I actually really enjoy teaching. Like I really enjoy teaching. You know, I enjoyed being in the front of the class. I enjoyed like teaching comp. I mean, I I, I really took to it. Um, and then it so then it became a dual track thing. You know, like I was getting to write and I was writing and I was getting feedback and I was working on things that I wanted to work on and the projects got more ambitious and I found my voice more. And then at the same time, I was kind of finding my footing in front of the classroom. Yeah. Which totally surprised me. I had no idea. Yeah. So when you were applying for jobs um, after you graduated, and how did you find out about NSU and Tahlequah and what went through your mind this, like, <laughs> thinking about working here? Yeah, I realized like, the ongoing theme of this is just like <laughs> the, the tumbleweeding of Murphy <laughs> like, falling yeah. into situations that I probably didn't earn at all, you know, or like had no like business being in. But I applied, after I graduated, I applied to, I don't know, 70 or 80 teaching jobs, you know, like easy, just yeah. right after graduating and nothing. You know, I got like three interviews, no, no campuses, nothing. Um, and so I waited tables and I attended bar. Um, and tried to keep my hand in it. I did some like ESL teaching. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it was a former, he wasn't even one of my professors, but a guy that who was in the department. And I had gone to like a couple seminars that he had given about getting jobs and teaching. And then like I had taken him out to like drink beers and play pool a couple times, you know, and like just been kind of like social with him. And I think he saw me waiting tables and was like, oh boy, like Murphy shouldn't be waiting tables, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, this job came open. Um, and the then chair reached out to him and said, hey, we, it's an emergency thing. We need to fill this in two weeks. You know, do you know anybody? He's like, yeah, I think I know a guy. And so he got in touch mm -hmm. with me. He's like, hey, you want a job in Tahlequah? Well, it seems pretty good. Like, why don't you toss your hat in the ring? And so I got in touch with him. I was like, man, I'd love this. And like, it was the sort of thing that I was flying to go home for August. So I they essentially told me about it on like a Wednesday. Like this guy, uh, David Jolliffe, was like, hey, I, they have an opening. I think, I think you'd be a fit for it. So I like send in my materials on Wednesday. I did my, scheduled my interview on Friday in like the Memphis airport where I was connecting. I did the first interview in my sister's bedroom mm -hmm. over the phone. I was in campus like a week and a half later and I was starting the semester like a week after that. Like yeah. it was, it's kind of how it goes. Yeah, yeah, it just all kind of. And then I, I found out much later that I was only supposed to be hired for a year <laughs> that was oh. the yeah. Oh. I had no idea. I'm glad I didn't know at all. Yeah. Um, but I, they hired me for a year as this kind of emergency one-time hire, and then one of the dudes in the department was taking a position somewhere else, and they were like, "Hey, you're already here. You're doing good work. We don't have anyone who teaches creative writing. You should keep on doing it. So like, you should apply for this position. So I applied for that, and then I got a, a permanent instructor position, and then kind of was off from there. Yeah. What do you learn 
from your students here? You're teaching them writing. What do they teach you? Oh, man. I mean, about writing, they don't teach me anything. No. Um, no. <laughs> you know, like that, that, that sounds like such a, like a jerk off thing to say, but like, I mean, they're, you know, they're, 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 I've already gone through what they've gone through a long, long, long time ago. I mean, they, they teach me, it's, it's more kind of values. They mm-hmm. teach me like, um, like it's just a constant process of like humility and a constant process of, of generosity and a constant process of, um, so those are like in, in terms of how I have to approach them and how they approach me and like in the best ways of, of creative conducive learning environment and the best ways of um, that I feel like it's, it's kind of like platonic to a degree that like you have to craft yourself to be a certain type of person as much as you can in order to be a good teacher. And if you're not, there's a chance you're going to be a good teacher. There's also a pretty good chance you're going to be a lousy teacher and you're going to and you're going to do you're going to be an unhealthy presence in, in your student's life. And so like a lot of it is like, if I'm going to teach them, I've got to write. And if, if I've got to believe them when they say that this is going on, I've got to help them work through it. I've got to remember what it was like to be at that stage and really in, in, in access it. And, and then what they give to me is it's just like, it's almost vampiric, which is, it sounds gross. It probably is gross, but like the, like there's just kind of like an energy that mm-hmm. students have and like a joy they have and like a, and a, a kind of force that they have that it can be really easy to lose through the years, become cynical and jaded or just lose your hunger. Um, and I feel like I constantly access that from them. You know, I, I, I work with them, I'm like, there, there's that joy again. You know, there's that like, that essence that, that you need to nurture and keep alive. Um, so I hope it's kind of, you know, like I, I, I give them some kind of like techniques and tricks and then they like, they keep me hopeful and engaged and like they keep me from hardening and becoming cynical and tired yeah, yeah. do they worry much about publishing and no. that kind of thing and do they try what do you try to tell them about failure or success or even thinking about those things I mean they they all think about publishing because we all do right I mean sure. that's you know like it's the dream and it's still it's, it's my dream and I hope it to, to be realized very soon but like you know there is that like you know, you walk into a bookstore and there you are, right? You know, yeah. like there's there's these people that you admire and there's these these people that you've learned from and there you are, you know? Mm-hmm. That is just such a, it's such a dream and it's an animating dream, you know? it's mm-hmm. I feel it, but it's, they feel it deeply and they want to see their names in print. They want, you know, they want that kind of uh, affirmation. Um, so part of it is that design, like the creative writing kind of arc to take them from like learning about craft, basics of craft and basics of criticism all the way to like getting ready to submit mm-hmm. and like learning about journals and what journals are out there and, and, and trying to engage in a writing community. But most of it is, is me just pumping the brakes and being like, don't worry about that yet. Don't, you know, like you just, you gotta kind of be in the minds, you gotta hammer away it, you gotta write your stories, you gotta finish your stories, you gotta revise your stories, you gotta find your voice, you gotta, you gotta work, 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 and then that stuff will come. Um, and I know they're chomping at the bit to kind of go ahead. And usually what happens is that they're chomping at the bit before when they have that kind of early thing where it's like they love this notion of themselves as a writer. Mm-hmm. And I'm always like, you know, Murphy, am I a writer? I'm like, do you write? Do you think about writing? That's it. That's it. Like, you just, you got to keep on doing that. Like, you taking naps in the middle of the day and, like, staying up late at night and drinking a lot of coffee and, like, mooning off into the distance and wearing funky clothes does not make you a writer, you know? Like, and publishing is not going to be more than that, you know? But what makes you a writer is is being in this discipline constantly and viewing the world constantly that way and then practicing constantly. And I try to imbue that sort of, that sort of system within them. And then... Usually by the time they get to the end, they're like, a lot of them are ready for publication, and then they are like, I don't know, <laughs> you yeah. know? like I don't know if I'm ready for this. I'm like, no, you are. Like you, you let's send your stuff out. Like it's there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but usually they're chopping at the bit at the beginning, and then they get real daunted in the middle, and then by the end they're thinking about other things. And I'm like, nope, now it's time to. And that really is, man. Like I had like a former student, who's, she's the current president of Write Club, which is the extracurricular writing group, and she just landed a few pieces, and it was just like, I mean, I obviously feel elation pieces and there's a great joy to it and that doesn't has not gone away from me at all mm-hmm. like seeing like I don't know it was like a particular sort of thrill and like yeah I don't know 
like she, she was so excited and I was like it was stuff that we had worked on together and I was like man that is really great you know it's just like made the rest of the day yeah, yeah. sure so you've published several flash fiction pieces I wanted mm -hmm. to talk about flash fiction sure. for a little bit um, it kind of seems like there's a almost a, re a recklessness or a sense of daring in, in flash fiction because you have to mm -hmm pinpoint a moment to contain the whole story in. How, mm. how do you find those moments when you're working on a piece? Because a thousand words or fewer is, how do you tell a whole story just with that? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it is just, um, some of it is, is that the, the length of the stories dictate them, you know, dictate themselves, right? That like, a story will feel like it's short, you know, mm -hmm. like, it, or it'll be like a concept, it'll be like, this concept can only carry so far. Yeah. Um, or it's like a conceit and I know that conceit is just not going to work long mm -hmm. um, in, in some of it is like like you said there's like a daring like it allows you to take so many risks because you can just cut so much out like one of the real joys that I've discovered in short fiction is that the years and years and years of reading short fiction there are certain attributes that I find that I I, that make me return to short fiction. And one of them is surprise. And it's not necessarily the surprise of the plot, like a plot twist or something like that. Yeah. But it's the surprise of, of one sentence leading to the next. And I think one of the earliest guys that really made me realize this was like Dennis Johnson and Jesus, his son. And like that, it was just like every sentence was a leap to the next. And it was like so acrobatic and so kind of breathtaking. You just go, how did he land? How did we get to this sentence from that sentence? Mm -hmm. um, and I was reading like a Joy Williams piece for, for a class. And she does the same sort of thing. It's just like, my God, like how did you, how did you launch from this and land here? And I feel like Flash is so exquisite for that because you can yeah. just make, take risk after risk after risk after risk. And like in a longer piece, it's, there's not going to be enough gravity to cohere that. But in a short piece, there's just enough that you can make these wonderful acrobatics. Um, I find it a really uh, demanding form. Mm -hmm. Because everything has to carry so much weight, but it's such a liberating form. Yeah. Because you have to worry. You, you don't have to worry about much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I've talked to some other writers about how they, or, or when they come up with an idea for a story, what that's like for them. Some people will just hear the voice of a character in their head, or there's a line mm -hmm. that gets stuck in their mind that doesn't go away. What What's it like for you? When do you know that? It's a story you have to keep working on and not abandon. I mean, the, I think the general rule is when it doesn't go away. Yeah. You know, like if there's something that like I keep on returning to, mm -hmm. like oh, I'm gonna have to work with that. Um, there's no kind of particular thing. Sometimes it's like a title. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's an instance. So like a like a, an action between two people or a moment between two people. Sometimes it's an attribute. Um, sometimes it's even a feeling. You know, like there's a. Mm -hmm like a sense of like trying to, and I think this is where flash and poetry kind of overlap. And I think they overlap a lot. Yeah. But one is that they're both really good at capturing effervescence. They're good at capturing the ephemeral. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's, there'll be times I'm like, I have an ephemeral feeling. Like I've got a piece that I'm, I'm trying to find a home for it. And a lot of it was just like Sandy Hook, like Sandy Hook left me feeling so shitty. Yeah. And I was like, I've got to get this out of me. And I knew I couldn't do it long. And so I just wanted to like say my piece about what I could about in fiction and in, in non polemically because art and politics just don't they work really uneasily together. Um, but I needed to get it out, and so I had to write a flash piece about it just to get it out. Um, but but more kind of generally, it's just it's just something that kind of arrives and then doesn't leave. I go, oh, I gotta make something of this. Yeah. yeah. And of course, like any writer, I magpie, you know, I'm like, oh, that thing, that thing, that thing, mm -hmm. put it in my pocket, you know, oh, that right. phrase is so great. Yeah. yeah. Um, so in what ways, if any, does living in Oklahoma inspire your work now? Do you write Oklahoma stories, in other words? I have just begun to. Okay. Um, I've got a theory that it's, it's not hard and fast, but essentially that you have to live in a place at least for a year. Mm -hmm. before you can write it in any way but as a stranger like you if you yeah. write a, if you haven't been in a place and lived in a place for a year you you have to write it as a stranger because you're not going to get it right and you're going to misrepresent and it's going to mm -hmm. be a mess and i think 
a year is probably too little. I think it takes more than that. I mean, it, I'd, I've only felt qualified barely to write Oklahoma over the past few years. And even, even then, I do it very cautiously. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think one of the things that is why it, it encourages my writing is, is one that like, I think writers just always feel like strangers. Like you, yeah. you're a stranger to your own life. And that's, some of it is you use writing to, to process your life. And some of it is like this natural kind of cognitive approach that I don't think you really have much control over in, that allows you that perspective to write, the impulse and the perspective to write. And it's like living in Oklahoma because I feel so foreign here still. Mm -hmm. And I never will not feel foreign here, you know. I mean, it's, I'm not, I'll never be at home here. Um, which is a horrible thing to say, but I don't think it's a bad thing. No. Um, but that kind of like distancing, it encourages, right? And it, it encourages even that like I hear people talking, I'm like, that phrase is wonderful, you know? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. oh my God, I want to use that phrase. Like, you know, like the things that I think you would passively just not even notice if you were in a place that you were very accustomed to. I never feel accustomed here. And so it constantly puts me in that space that writing puts me into anyways. What makes a good ending then in a flash piece? Because they're always kind of, or is closure even something that matters? When do you know that, okay, I'm going to stop it here? One of the things I like about flash, and it, it's, you know, you can do it in any sort of fiction, like, yeah. you know, Fitzgerald did it in Gatsby, or like Joyce did it in The Dead, but like with flash, you can go really big with the endings. Because mm -hmm. like there's this kind of like, this vertigo where like you you're in the story and then you just zoom at the end like you, you just go wicked big with the language and you go in you can you, you can kind of make declarative statements and you can you can summarize or you can twist um and so a lot of what i enjoy about flash is when you at the end you just like swing from the heels you know mm -hmm. and see what and see what sort of bigness you can kind of capture um almost always with with most of my Endings with flash pieces, I write it, and then whatever I've written, I cut it away, and the ending was earlier. Mm -hmm. You know, something that, like, I was probably not, I was scared of. I was like, oh, I love that turn of phrase. I don't know if I can land there, though. That's a little bit too much. Let me keep on writing, and then I keep on writing. I'm like, no, this isn't, I don't need this <laughs> stuff. Yeah. yeah, it's yeah. kind of part of the whole process. Yeah. But I very rarely, to, to go to your question, mm -hmm. what I think might be the gist of it is I very rarely am, like, cognizant of, of, the length and I'm like oh I gotta stop here you know like oh it's, yeah. it's going too long here you know like it's much more like okay the story's petering like where was that beat that was mm -hmm. really the beat I wanted yeah it's definitely a pulse to mm -hmm. flash mm -hmm. writing and you can you can mm -hmm. feel it I mean, just even as a as a reader yeah what the heart of it is and when it's time to let it go yeah and you should never feel settled you know like I, I feel like it's yeah they are unsettling I think mm -hmm. maybe that's part of the appeal mm -hmm. of them yeah, like you feel buffeted the whole time, and then like at the end there should be a big win that just knocks you over, and then you're like, you're like, well, where did that come from? Like, yeah. yeah, they kind of stick stick with you, mm -hmm. kind of, or they do for me. Yeah, that's the hope is that they the linger. Yeah. You know? So you've written some, um, you've published some creative nonfiction essays too. I'm thinking mm -hmm. of um, a piece you wrote for the Land Press called At Risk. Yeah. Which it's about a social worker named Sherry who works in this area. Mm -hmm. How how did the idea for that come about? Um, I mean, some of it is just that I had former students who were in social work, mm -hmm. and that like this, like I'm I'm a kind of like my office is located at like an outpost of English, mm -hmm. and like it's a, you know this is the director of the the social work majors kind of over here, and like a lot oh, of the social work okay. folks are around me, um, and so first I just heard my student talking about like home visits and talking about the work mm -hmm. and there's a cultural thing especially in Oklahoma where like certain people get to be heroes and certain people don't like vets get to be heroes yeah you know maybe cops get to be heroes maybe athletes get to be heroes and I tend to have a much broader view of what is heroic action um so like nurses I think a lot of times are really heroic and I think social workers are heroic. Like, mm -hmm. I think the work they do is so vital and so difficult and so, and usually done without any notion of uh, reward or, like, valor. 
um, yeah. that I, you know, I would hear these stories and be like, man, I want it. And especially around here because A, the, the social work environment here is tough because it's a, there's rural poverty. So you have like real endemic, rough poverty, but it's so isolated because you don't mm-hmm. see, it's not like a housing development where it's all together. You know, you have these folks yeah. who live in like these houses that are falling apart and roach infested and, and kids living in squalor. You just don't see them. And, and they can't get out, you know, they're mm-hmm. stuck. They need to uh, get a ride from a friend or from their mom or something. Um, and then, of, of course, the current situation in Oklahoma where is, there's just this ongoing erosion makes it seem like it's a natural process and it's not. It's a very active process of, like, stripping away the safety net mm-hmm. and, like, this real kind of cruel impulse that I get mine and, like, everyone else is leeching off the system and they're lazy yeah. and, therefore, they don't deserve my money, my tax money, which is this real ungenerous thing. I mean, I see taxes as, like, that's, that's, that's the investment you make in having a good community. That's the payment you make for living in a good society. And here, it's, it's like, no, taxes are things that are stolen from me that I earned. Um, and because of that, you get these folks who barely had a safety net to begin with, having even that little bit of safety net stripped away. So you have social workers who are like these crazy caseloads because they're just shutting offices because they got no funding. Um, so I just, the more I kind of thought about it, the more I was like, man, this is, this is, in my limited way, a story that I want to tell. Yeah, and the details you included in that that piece, um, they're so striking, for one, because you, you, you capture a dignity to it, I thought. There's this mm-hmm. lyricism to uh, the descriptions and just kind of a whole a movement mm-hmm. to the piece, but without sacrificing the reality or the bleakness of it. Mm-hmm. So did you go on home visits? Did you do interviews? No, I wasn't allowed to. Yeah, because yeah. I, yeah. I wondered about about that. Yeah, no, I just, I just... From asking questions to... Yeah, I mean, a lot of it was like I initially... And this is... As I've, as I've gotten more comfortable with writing and I've gotten mm-hmm. more comfortable with voice or my approach, whatever, process, whatever, like... What I do is I just do a shit ton of research. So, mm-hmm. like, I interviewed all the folks around me. I interviewed my former student. I had her okay. get in touch with folks and interviewed. I read literature on, on home visits and on and on the you know the statistics and the, and how one is supposed to conduct a home visit and that sort of thing. And just kind of saturated myself in it as much as possible, and then wrote it, relying on instinct, and then showed it to those people and said, "Where did I get it wrong?" Mm-hmm. And it's just, it, it's a weird thing. I don't attach any sort of mysticism towards it, but it's strange how the brain works that if you saturate yourself in that enough, you make instinctual leaps that end up proven correct. And so, I mean, I, I, you know, I've been to houses that are kind of like that, but I've certainly never been on a home visit. And, and I, my experience with rural poverty is pretty limited. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, there was just enough and just enough talking my instinct run and then I showed it to folks and they were like yeah this is all right that wouldn't happen or yeah this is all right but like you can't do that you know and then I would just adjust accordingly mm-hmm. yeah but most of it was grounded in reality but not it was not journalistic yeah yeah and you mentioned something about our cruel impulses here that whole I've got to get mine mm-hmm. mentality which it's something that's kind of come up in other interviews you know, on the one hand, people from here can be warm and kind mm-hmm. and will help you mm-hmm. do anything. But then on the other hand, we have this dark side to us. Mm-hmm. Do you think that's um, that speaks to our history here in, in Oklahoma? Because mm-hmm. that, to me, just seems to be kind of a distinct, a distinctly Oklahoma thing in, yeah. some, in its way. Yeah. And I don't know if it's distinctly Oklahoma that like yeah. I would guess that like a lot of Texans that way they're just more arrogant about it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're just louder about it. I don't know. It's yeah. I think it's totally cultural. I don't think there's mm-hmm. some like inherent aspect to the people around here that makes them that way. It's just you know a lot of I, this is not I think mine and it's certainly almost cliche. But like th- there's very few attributes that are positive or negative. They're just attributes that have positive or negative um, uh, expressions. Mm-hmm. And so like I think Oklahomans tend to be like really focused on the close unit, the family unit, yeah. the local unit, you know, the, those that are directly around. And there's very little faith placed in like the larger 
what feels like more abstract units, mm -hmm. state government, or or kind of wider community, you know, communities that you're not attached to. Um, and so there is a sense that what is immediately tangible in here mm -hmm. um, is of value and is of necessity and needs to be taken care of. And that and it is true, like there's a warmth to Oklahoma, there's a, a generosity of like time mm -hmm. and of, um, and of material, you know, that, <laughs> sorry, I just shit down. No, I'm uh, messing with that. Sorry. Like, it, there's a there's a real warmth there. It's just that warmth doesn't extend. And I think some of it is historical, too, in that, like, yeah. life here is hard. And it's, like, it seems like it's always been hard. There's always yeah. been, like, struggle with the land. There's always been, it's never been a rich place. Um, and, and so, like, the, what is taken for granted is much smaller. Um, so like so like a positive attribute is like people just take care of their stuff really well here. Like they, mm -hmm. they value like a they value work in a way that is really actual. I think you know it's like hard work and, it, and that's kind of like a cliched thing, but I think it's true. Like people yeah. there is a real value of hard work here, and and a necessity of like like it, how it's manifest like back home. Like if something is wrong, you just call someone to take care of it. Like just take care. Of it. Like I'm just I'm gonna throw money at it. Just take care of it, right? Or just like get someone to figure that out, right? Whereas here, it's like, no, you gotta go figure that out. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, it's really admirable. And there's like the, in the notion of like taking care of one's things, and valuing one's things is really admirable, but it leads to like this really um, overvaluing what is tangible versus what is abstract. And so like, you go, oh, those people, Right, those yeah. people don't deserve X, and those people are like abstractions. Even though those people share attributes, and I've seen this so many times, it's mm -hmm. like, man, like your aunt Nancy is on public assistance, like she needs help, <laughs> like, like she's using the system. She's like, oh, well, Nancy needs this, but those people are just using it. I'm like, no, Nancy is no different at all. But yeah. there's this weird kind of disconnect between um, between those I know and those I can see, and those that I immediately value and the everybody else. Yeah, I think that's a good way. Yeah of summarizing that. Yeah. So what are you working on now? I um, finished a manuscript. This is an espionage novel. It has nothing to do. There's a very brief portion in Oklahoma, mostly. Mm -hmm. It involves... Um, the conceit is that the, the, it's a guy who, who writes covers, who writes either for folks in the field or folks who are being hidden, and he writes their lives. So he gets biographicals and writes their lives. Mm -hmm. um, and he is... Um, an expat. He's a guy whose mother brought him out of Nicaragua during the time the Sandinistas in the, in the early to mid 80s. Um, and as this kind of espionage aspect kind of tightens around him, there's all sorts of conspiracy. There's, there's worries about leaks, and he's simultaneously learning about his past and things that he did not know about his family and about his mother. Um, and so he is simultaneously kind of like building on like this this larger awareness of his past and how his past works with him while at the same time realizing the system he's complicit in and, and the dangers of that. And so I got that done of, I don't know how many drafts. Yeah. <laughs> many, many, I mean, this has been years in the making. Yeah, and I've got a, it out. a novel. Oh, yes, yeah, a novel, okay. yeah. Um, and it's, I've got it out now to um, essentially two editors, but they're two editors who, they're freelancers. One who's going to read it and give me feedback and one who's specifically going to read it for the Spanish and for the representation, because I'm not mm. Nicaraguan, I'm not, mm -hmm. you know, this is in many ways not my story to tell. And so I want to yeah. make sure I'm telling it responsibly. Um, and then hopefully I'll be shopping it out in the next late spring. I'm mean, trying to get it either out to agents or out to publishing houses. And then in the meantime, I'm writing Flash. Although in the moment, I'm like uninspired and it has been like a week and a half of just agony. Like it's just like <laughs> sitting in front of the page and being like, there's nothing there. And I open up old stuff. I'm like, I hate this. You know, I'm, like, it's, yeah. I'm in the worst place right now. And I know it's going to go away. Yeah. 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 But it, it sucks. <laughs> so tonight is I'm, I'm going to sit down again and hopefully. And that's the great thing about Flash too is that like, yeah. especially, you know, you write a novel and it's just like never ending. And like, oh my right. God, the cutting and all these sorts of things. And I get to like, okay, I, I send it out to you. You're looking at it now. There's nothing I can do to it. It's like, let me work on this like jewel, this tiny like, yeah. you know, thing. And I can just run with it and get it done in one setting and, and put it away. So hopefully that's what's going to happen right. tonight. <laughs> yeah. 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 Good luck with that. Thanks. Um, is there anything else you'd like to talk about? Um, 
I mean, one thing that I that I think you're probably going to experience mm -hmm. that I feel like I should just give a plug for, and, and this was initially pointed out to me by Jeanette Mish, who's the current poet laureate, is that the writing community in Oklahoma is like wonderful. Mm -hmm. Like it is, it's a, unlike writing communities I've seen anywhere else. And I don't know if it's because it's in opposition to other kind of cultural forces in Oklahoma, mm -hmm. or it is there's an underdog aspect to it, or it's just kind of an aspect of isolation and that's so the folks are so scattered I'm like it's not like Brooklyn or something yeah um, but it's just like a crazy good community like everyone I've met is like they, yeah they love talking shop and they love talking craft and like telling stories but a lot of it is just like support of each other's work and like putting out each other's work I just I don't know it's again throughout these points in my life I've landed in situations where I've been really lucky to be surrounded by people who um, who, who, who I can talk with and who appreciate what I do and and so I appreciate what they do. And yeah. even though it's a much broader community here than just in Tahlequah, it's here too. Um, and then I see it with students, like they're just, I want them to go out and kind of be part of this community and strengthen it and make sure that the Oklahoma writing community is, this kind of continues to be this thriving, like warm thing that it is. All right, great. Yeah. Thanks so much for your time. Yeah.